All right, I'm going to take a look at the 2008 non-calculator multiple choice. First question is limit as x approaches infinity. You don't want this thing in parentheses. You really want to distribute this. Um, I have an idea what's going to happen here, but I am going to go ahead and distribute uh, just to make a point here. Um, so I'm going to have 2x times 2x times negative x, which is negative 2x squared. And then I'm going to have a 6x and an x. I think it's plus 7x. And then minus 3. The bottom there, uh, we're going to have x squared plus 2x minus 3. Okay, it's going to look something like that. Um, remember, we're looking at this as the limit as x approaches infinity. And so really what's happening here, if you just want to look at this, x squared grows faster than anything else here. Really, you don't particularly need to look at any of these other values. This is going to approach the same limit as negative 2x squared over x squared, which really just approaches negative 2. So correct answer should be B. Now, in a pre-cal class, you may have been taught appropriately to divide everything by the highest power of x. And so you'd have 7x over x squared. That would go to 0. Negative 3 over x squared. That would go to 0. This over x squared would go to the 0. That would 2. If we divide both these by x squared, you'd just be left with the negative 2 over 1. Uh, you could also use L'Hopital's rule. Uh, L'Hopital's rule, you could just take the derivative of the top and the bottom. Uh, the first time you take the derivative, you would get negative 4x plus 7 over 2x plus 2. And you'd still be taking the same limit. It's the limit as x approaches infinity. Uh, this is because it would be approaching <coughs> infinity over infinity previously. It's technically negative infinity over infinity, but uh, still you get that indeterminate infinity over infinity. And technically, you get the same kind of thing again. So you can take the derivative again. You can take the limit as x approaches infinity and take the derivative of the top and the bottom and you end up getting negative 2. So several ways to do this, kind of a common sense way and um, using L'Hopital's rule. Uh, number 2, that is not a natural log. That's x to the negative 2 power. Um, always rewrite using negative exponents before you use the power rule. Power rule, raise the power by 1, divide by the new power. Um, technically, you should have a plus c there as well. Oh, I'm sorry, that should be divided by negative 1. Uh, don't leave negative exponents unless, um, well, actually, they left a negative exponent there. Look at that. 2 looks like it's d. I'm really surprised. Normally, I would rewrite that as negative 1 over x to the first plus c. But anyway, they did not have that option in the answer, so I'll take it. All right? Moving on uh, to the next question here. They ask you to find this derivative. Notice it's a product, so I'm going to need to use the product rule. Forrester's version of that says take the derivative of the first term times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Derivative of the first term there is 1 times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Uh, that's going to be power rule, so we're going to have 3 times x squared plus 2 squared. And then I need to multiply by the derivative of the inside function, which is 2x. And uh, again, I might want to simplify some things down. I have a feeling this might be factored as well. Um, let's see, so we've got an x squared plus 2 cubed. And then we've got a plus 6x times the quantity x minus 1 times x squared plus 2 quantity squared. Right. <laughs> to make a quick edit here, I accidentally uh, left a step out. Um, anyway, I'm going to factor out the x squared plus 2 quantity cubed. Uh, actually, quantity squared, because there are two that can be factored out of each. Uh, that's going to leave me with a single x squared plus 2, and then plus 6x times the quantity x minus 1. And I'm unfortunately going to have to simplify, because you look over at the answers. We've got a couple of things. Uh, C and D both have an x squared plus 2 squared out front. But anyway, I'm going to get an x squared plus 2 here. I'm going to get plus a 6x squared minus a 6x. Uh, that's going to be 7x squared minus 6x plus 2 when you simplify it. And uh, that, in fact, looks like it's going to be option D. Okay. Moving on. Uh, we have an integral here, and it's an integral of a sum. So I can break that up into two parts. Uh, antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. 
Uh, we do need to be careful here. That's a sine of 2x. Derivative of the inside function is 2. We don't have a 2, so we can multiply one in, but we need to balance it with a 1 half. Antiderivative of sine is negative cosine, since so it can be negative 1 half cosine of 2x would be our first part. Uh, for the second part of this integral, we can break this up. We can do plus cosine of 2x dx. Uh, derivative of the inside function is 2. We don't have one, so we can balance it with a 1 half. And that's going to be 1 half sine of quantity 2x, and then plus c. And let's see if that matches up with one of our answers. That looks like it is option b. All right, continuing to roll along. All right, next question, limit question. Uh, be careful, so limit as x approaches 0, uh, not infinity. So if you put 0 in there, you get 0 over 0, which is, of course, uh, an indeterminate form, uh, which says nothing about our limit. Um, you could probably either use L'Hopital's rule, or you could try to factor. Uh, I noticed that I can factor an x squared out of the top, so trying to write it in a different form a lot of times uh, ends up giving us something. And then in the bottom, I can factor an x squared out as well. And that's going to be 3x squared minus 16. And notice that I can cancel the x squareds, and I can try my limit again as x approaches 0. Let's try this one. If that's 0, we get 8. I'll put a 0 in there. If I put a 0 in there, I get negative 16. And that looks like negative 1 half. And uh, that is, in fact, one of the choices. All right, on to number 6. Uh, they give us this piecewise function here. And uh, we have to decide, is it been limited to, is it continuous, and is it differentiable? Well, uh, first of all, if it's continuous, that means that the function will connect on both sides, and the functional value at that point is included. Um, so basically, I need to check the two different sides. Um, I can't substitute 2 into this function. Um, so everything else is approaching 2, but I need to see, is this also approaching 2? So basically look to see if the left and right hand limits are the same. Notice, however, that factors, that's the quantity x plus 2 times the quantity x minus 2, all over x minus 2, and I can cancel the x minus 2's. So this behaves the same as x plus 2, um, except that it'll be defined at 2. And notice if I put 2 in there, I get 4. Um, 2 plus 2 is 4, and meanwhile the functional value is 1. So uh, it's not going to be continuous because the functional value is not the same thing as the limit. If you look at this, for all values that aren't 2, it's approaching this. So for values slightly less than 2, it should approach this. For values slightly greater than 2, it should approach this. So it will have a limit but it's basically going to have a hole. It's going to be, you know, this kind of thing where there's a gap and there's a hole at a, at a different point. Um, actually, it's the other way around. It's the function's approaching a value at 4, and then there's a point below at 1. But anyway, that sort of thing is happening. So, uh, so anyway, uh, does it have a limit? Yes, it does. Is it continuous? No, it's not. Remember, if a function's not continuous, it's also not differentiable. So um, we're just done at that point, and we can move on. Okay, particle moves along the x-axis with velocity given by that function. If the particle is at position 2 at time equals 0, what's the position of the particle at time equals 1? Well, uh, you can either take an antiderivative here or you can just use a definite integral. Um, I think a definite integral would work really well here. We have an initial position of 2. Uh, we have a rate. It's a velocity. So we can accumulate the change that takes place because of that rate using an integral. And the initial time was 0. So we're starting at 0, and we're accumulating change until the time is equal to 1. So let's see, the antiderivative here, that's going to be t cubed plus 3t squared, evaluated between 0 and 1. Uh, don't forget that we need to add that 2 to all of that. Uh, at 0, this is all going to be 0, so I just need to evaluate it at 1. That's going to be 1 plus 3, which is 4. Uh, so 2 plus 4 is equal to 6. And I did include my initial position in there, and so looks like the answer there 
is going to be b. All right, moving on. Uh, we have a derivative, uh, we want to find a derivative of the cosine function. Derivative of cosine is negative sine of the same thing. But I have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function, which is going to be 3. Uh, and so then I need to sub in pi over 9. So that's going to be negative 3 sine of 3 times pi over 9. That's 1 third pi or pi over 3. Uh, remember that sine of pi over 3 is equal to radical 3 over 2. So it's negative 3 times radical 3 over 2. And that looks like the answer is, uh, looks like it's going to end up being e for number 8. Okay, next one. Um, okay, so we have a function g defined as an integral of that graph right there. And they're asking us which of the following values is greatest. Um, okay, so of course g of negative 2 is going to be the integral from negative 2 to negative 2. That's just going to be 0. Um, g of 0, that's going to be the integral from negative 2 up to 0. That's going to be this region here, which is basically, let's see, it's a 1 by 2 triangle, which has an area of 1, 2 by 2, uh, 2 by 1, uh, so that's going to have an area of 3, so that's my functional value at 0. Uh, g of 1, we're going to be finding the integral from negative 2 up to 1. So we're going to take our previous integral that's 3, and then we have a 1 by 2 triangle with an area of 1. So that whole area from negative 2 up to 1 is going to be 4, so that's g of 1. And finally, g of 2, uh, notice g of 2, you have negative values that drop down through here, so we're going to have, uh, we're going to lose values, so I don't think that's useful. Um, g of negative 3, you're going from negative 2 back to negative 3. And if you notice, since you're going backwards, that would actually give us a negative region there because we would have to change the bounds to go from x to negative 2 and make it negative um, if we are going to switch in the other direction. So anyway, uh, greatest value here should be d. Okay. Uh, which has the least value here? Okay, the integral from 1 to 3 of this function, okay, you can see that there. The left Riemann sum approximation, um, let's see, the left Riemann sum, so we're picking values on the left. Well, if you pick values on the left, uh, your high point, because it's decreasing, is going to be there. Left Riemann sum is going to be uh, bigger than the actual integral. Um, the right Riemann sum is going to be picking points on the right-hand side, and that'll be picking low points, that'll be under the curve. Uh, I'm not drawing this very well, probably should mark that up before. Uh, but the right Riemann sum is going to be the lowest so far. Uh, midpoint Riemann sum, you'll basically have rectangles that are kind of in between. Part will be sticking out, part will be under. Uh, that won't be less than the right sum. And then the trapezoidal approximation will be slightly under, but uh, not too much. I think it's 10c, and uh, yeah, 10c is correct. And continuing, okay, so I have a graph of a function here. I want a graph of its derivative. Remember, the derivative is graphing slopes. Uh, so I usually look for where slopes are zero. Uh, that's a key thing that I can see. So we can see we have a zero slope about right here. So we're looking for a function that has zeros here. We've got one there. Uh, we don't have one here, so that's just, that's just out. Um, we've got a zero value there. That's good. Uh, we don't have one here, so that's out. Um, let's see, where are other places where the slopes are zero? We've got a place where the slope is zero there. Um, so we can see that happening on this graph. Um, this graph is going to have three places with slopes of zero, so that one should also be out. And then this graph has it, and uh, that one doesn't. So we're down to two choices. We're down to just D and B. Uh, notice this is a third degree function. Both of these are second degree, so that's not going to help. Um, but now let's keep look at signs of derivatives. That's a negative slope there, so we should have negative derivative values. And we can see we have negative derivative values here. Uh, we have positive derivative values there, so it should be b. All right. Uh, we want to take the derivative of this e function. Uh, we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function, and this one is set up weirdly. So 
Uh, I'm going to rewrite that instead of 2 over x to the first, I'm going to rewrite that as 2x to the negative 1. I'm going to move that up as a negative exponent. Uh, the derivative of 2x to the negative 1 would be negative 2x to the negative 2, uh, which is also the same thing as negative 2 over x squared if I move that negative exponent back down. So remember, e to the x is its own derivative, so it's going to be e to the 2 over x, and then I just have to multiply by that derivative of that inside function. Uh, which is negative 2 over x squared, or negative 2x to the negative 2. And uh, anyway, uh, that looks like, I think it's uh, choice D. All right, number 13. Let's see if we can get this focused a little better. No. There we go. Uh, all right, I want to take the derivative of f of ln of x. So that's going to be uh, basically ln of x squared plus 2 times ln of x, and I want to take the derivative of that. So outside function is the squaring function, so that's going to be 2, it's power rule. Drop the power to 1, multiply by the derivative of the inside function, 1 over x, and then we take the derivative of the second part, uh, that's going to be 2 times 1 over x, which is just 2 over x, and let's see, uh, I could factor out, I could write that as uh, 2 ln of x over x plus 2 over x. Notice we have common denominators there, so we could add the numerators and write that as 2 ln of x plus 2 all over x. And if you take a look at number 13, that looks a whole lot like choice A. All right. Take a look at 14. Uh, 14, they give you a polynomial function. They have a bunch of values of the second derivative, f double prime, and we want to figure out what's happening here. Um, so, of course, the second derivative determines concavity. So, for example, at zero, this function has a positive uh, second derivative, so it is concave up. Um, there's zero second derivative there, which basically means it's a straight function. There's not any concavity. Uh, it's concave down when x is equal to 2. Negative 7 is concave up again at 4. Um, so one of our choices is, is the function increasing on the interval from 0 to 2? Um, I don't believe we have enough information there. You can have a function that's concave up or concave down and is increasing or decreasing, so I don't think that tells us anything. Uh, number two, f is decreasing on the interval from zero to two. Well, same thing, uh, I don't think we can tell an increase or a decrease. You can have concave up or concave down, and your function can be increasing or decreasing, so that doesn't tell us anything. Okay, local maximum at x equals one. A local maximum at x equals 1. Well, let's see there. We do have a second derivative at 0, but I, I don't think we know anything else there. Um, okay, choice D. Graph of f has a point of inflection x equals 1. Well, at 1, uh, these are just selected values there, but at 1 the derivative is, the second derivative is 0. Um, so the concavity could be changing signs. Uh, that is definitely a possibility, but we don't know what happens between 0 and 1 and between 1 and 2. I don't think we know that for sure. So let's see what choice uh, C, uh, D, uh, choice E is. It says the graph of f changes concavity in the interval between 0 and 2. Well, if you go back here and you look at the interval from 0 to 2, uh, yes, somewhere between 0 and 2, this is a continuous function, um, we've got a positive second derivative here, eventually it becomes negative. So yes, concavity has to change somewhere there. That should be choice E. That's the only one that we know for sure. Some of the other choices could be true, but we don't necessarily know that they all are. Okay, next one here. Uh, you have a reciprocal function, that is uh, an x squared minus 4 that would be to the negative 1 power if you raised it to the numerator, uh, which means you can rewrite this as the integral of 1 over x squared minus 4 times x dx. Uh, why is the x there? Well, the derivative of the inside function is 2x. We need a 2x. If I multiply it at 2, I can balance it with a 1 half. And we should just be able to use a natural log function of that 
denominator. We've got a one half out in front. We've got the plus c, and uh, there there we go. So uh, that is choice c, I believe. Yes, it is choice c. All right, moving on to number sixteen. Okay, number 16 is uh, a derivative, but notice there's a y there, which means I'm going to have to use implicit differentiation. Uh, so remember how implicit works. You take the derivative of the outside function just like normal, but then the chain rule says I have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function. Uh, that's a product, and there's an x and a y. Product rule says I take the derivative of the first times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second. So the derivative, and by the way, all of this derivative is going to be multiplied by the cosine of xy. Uh, derivative of x is, is just 1, or we can say derivative of x with respect to x, since we're taking the derivative implicitly, which is the same thing as 1. Derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Derivative of y would be 1 dy dx. So that's gone. Uh, and we end up with something that looks like that. I don't think that matches any of the choices over here. Um, so we're going to have to try to put this into some kind of uh, a different form. Oh, we're not done anyway. Uh, it's a sign of xy equals x. Uh, so we're going to have to set it equal to the derivative of x on the other side here. Uh, derivative of x, again, is just dx dx or 1. And we want to solve for dy dx, I think. Yeah. So uh, I think I'm going to have to distribute here. I'm going to get y times the cosine of xy plus dy dx times x times the cosine of xy is equal to 1. And then I can move all of this to the other side. I'm going to subtract that. So that's dy dx x cosine of xy is equal to 1 minus y cosine of xy. And then I'll divide everything by x cosine of xy. I really hope that they have something in this form over there. Uh, so let's see, if we look at d, d is the same thing. Looks good. All right, number 17. Uh, we have a function here. They say we have horizontal tangents at 2 and 5. Uh, we have a function, let's see if you can see that a little better. Uh, g is defined as the integral from 0 to x of function f, which is shown here. Uh, we want to know where the graph has a point of inflection. So that's where the second derivative changes sign. Uh, we want to find information about g double prime. Well, uh, if, if g is equal to this integral here, g prime would be the derivative of the integral, which would just be f of x. If I take the derivative again, g double prime would be equal to f prime of x. So we're looking to see where f prime changes signs. f prime is the slope. So we're looking to see where does f prime change from a positive, or where does f change from having a positive slope to having a negative slope, or the other way around. Where does the slope change signs? So that happens here, and the slope changes signs over here. So it looks like it should be at 2 and at 5. And that is option C, and that is the correct answer. Okay. Moving on, uh, in the xy plane, the line x plus y equals k, where k is a constant, is tangent to the graph of y equals x squared plus 3x plus 1. We want to know the value of k. Um, so if it's tangent, it's got to have the same slope uh, at that point, and they also don't give us the point. Oh, that's lovely. Um, okay. Well, let's... Okay, so the slope of the tangent line, y prime is equal to 2x plus 3. And that has to have the same slope as the line x plus y equals k. Well, the slope of x plus y equals k, if you solve for y, that's negative k plus x, uh, negative x plus k, that's a slope of negative 1. So the derivative needs to be negative 1, and we can solve that equation. 2x is going to be negative 4, x is going to be negative 2. Um, so we're looking for a point where x is negative 2. 
when x is negative 2, y is going to be, let's see, if x is negative 2, that'll be 4. That'll be negative 6, and that's 1. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1, so y would be negative 1. Uh, so we're looking at that point. So that's the point that needs to be on both graphs. So if x plus y is equal to k, x has to be negative 2, y has to be negative 1. That means k has to be negative 3, and that means that the answer to 18 is a. All right. Uh, this next question asks, what are all the horizontal asymptotes of the graph y equals 5 plus 2 to the x over 1 minus 2 to the x? Uh, this question is actually kind of famous because uh, a lot of people oversimplify the definition of uh, asymptotes. Um, remember, a horizontal asymptote, just in general, if you draw a graph and you're approaching a horizontal asymptote, that's the y value that you approach as x goes out infinitely. But it could also be the y value that's approached as x goes out to negative infinity. Uh, the key here, technically, horizontal asymptotes happen as x approaches positive infinity, and they might happen as x approaches negative infinity. And a lot of times we get lazy and we, we only list one. Uh, this one, I believe, actually has two asymptotes. So anyway, if you look at this, uh, the fastest growing part of your function is uh, 2 to the x. Uh, so we really want to look at that. The limit of 2 to the x as x approaches positive infinity is 2 to the x over negative 2 to the x. Um, and uh, anyway, those should simplify and just be negative 1. Um, if we do it the other way around, if we look at the limit as x approaches negative infinity, take a look at what happens here. Uh, you have 2 to the x over negative 2 to the x, but this is really 2 to the negative infinity over negative 2 to the negative infinity. And if we flip-flop these values here, oh, uh, actually, you know what? A 2 to a negative infinity actually goes to 0 because that's 1 over 2 to the infinity. So if you look up here, the constants are actually going to stay the same. It would be 5 plus 2 to the negative infinity over 1 minus 2 to the negative infinity. That's going to 0. That's going to 0. So it's just going to approach 5 over 1, and it approaches 5. That's fascinating. Yeah, that is not a standard problem at all. Um, but the answer actually ends up being E because you get very different answers if you have negative exponents versus positive exponents. Oh, that one's fascinating. Good question. Controversial question, but a good one. Okay. Uh, number 20. What do we got going on here? Uh, we've got a function with a second derivative given by that equation, and we want the x-coordinates of the points of inflection of that graph. Um, so remember, inflection points are where your function changes sign, where your second derivative changes sign. So we want to know places where the second derivative could be zero because that's where we have possible changes in the sign. Okay, so that would happen when x is zero, three, or six. Those are the only places where we could have possible changes in sign of the second derivative. So I just need to pick values in each of those intervals. Uh, if I pick negative one, that would be positive, that would be negative, that would be negative, and I would get a positive, that would be concave up. If I pick positive 1, that would be positive, that'll be negative, that'll be negative, we get positive. So you notice there's no change in concavity there. Um, if I pick something like 4, that's positive, that's positive, that's negative. So we do get a change there happening at 3. And then finally, if I pick something bigger than 6, like 7, I get positive, 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 that's positive, we get a change in the sign again there too. So it looks like it should be 3 and 6 only for number 20. And we move on to number 21. Okay, we have a particle moving along a straight line. The graph of the position uh, x of t at time t is shown above. It has horizontal tangents at those places there at 1 and 5. And it has a point of inflection at t equals 2. But what values of t is the velocity increasing? Okay. So we're looking for places where the velocity 
is increasing. Be careful. Velocity increasing. A change in velocity is an acceleration. We're looking for a positive acceleration is what's really happening here. Uh, acceleration is a second derivative. We're looking at f double prime. f double prime is concavity. Uh, so we're actually looking to see where this is concave up. Um, well, if you look at it, it's concave up, starting at zero, going all the way over here to three, uh, actually over here to two. Notice it says that there's a point of inflection at t equals two. So that's where the concavity changes at two. And uh, that's it. It should just be between zero and two. Uh, I think the answer should be a, which it is according to the answer key. All right. Continuing to move ahead. Okay. Uh, rumor spreads among a population of n people at a rate proportional to the product of the number of people who have had heard the rumor and the number of people who have not heard it. Okay. So p is the number of people who have heard it, and the whole population is n. So n minus p would be the number of people who haven't heard it. So it's directly proportional to the product of people who have heard it and people who have not heard it. And notice it's at a rate proportional, direct proportion. You have a constant being multiplied by your product. So directly proportional, k times the product of the people who have heard it and haven't. And notice here that it says um, we're talking about the rate of change of this rumor spreading. So that's a dp dt. So anyway, it should be, um, looks like choice B. Yep, that is correct.